Caitlin Jean, could you come up here? Caitlin Jean. Because you have. All right, everybody, this is, this is Caitlin Jean. This is one of my daughters. Can y'all say hi, Caitlin? Hi. Caitlin, this is everybody. <laughs> so I want to ask you a couple questions, okay? okay. How old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen. When's your birthday? April 3rd. Okay, so you're going to be 14 pretty soon. What grade are you in? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Do you like school? Yes. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> What's your favorite subject? So, what do you want to be when you grow up? What's your dream? What's your vision? Nice. And um, what university do you want to attend when you graduate? <laughs> Trimester, 
Well, Mary probably experienced what, what most women experienced there. She started to get a hankering or a weird appetite for some funny things, right? Like uh, peanut butter and celery ice cream. <laughs> Anybody ever had kids, had a pregnant wife? And then it becomes dad's responsibility at 3 o'clock in the morning if mom wants some peanut butter and celery ice cream to go get some peanut butter and celery ice cream, right? And there's probably that kind of exchange between Joseph and Mary. And then in that third trimester, the baby doubles in size and weight and becomes this perfectly formed little human being in her womb. And what often happens in that trimester for mom is she gets some back pain. But isn't pregnancy such a wonderful time of expectancy and joy and excitement as we're wondering what this child's going to be? Is it going to be a boy or a girl? Is it going to favor mom or dad? Is it going to have brown eyes or blue eyes? What's their dream? What's their vision? What are they going to be? It's a time of expectation and joy and elation in the life of the parents. But then as that last trimester comes to a conclusion, what usually happens? Well, some trepidation and some fear and the realization that, hey, I'm going to have to push this baby through this birth canal. And that was probably a realization that Mary made, that through this virgin womb of the mother Mary, she was going to have this child Jesus. And so that expectancy and that joy turns into fear and pain as, as you get closer to the moment of birth. And then the contractions come. 8-1,000, 9-1,000, 10-1,000, push. And Mary was not simply just bearing a child into the world. This child, uh, all children are special. But this child that was in Mary's womb was the Son of God. Fully human, fully God. And so this birth of Jesus into the world was not simply just the coming of a child. It was the birth of a king. The countdown was on. The long-awaited Messiah that for thousands of years people have been waiting for and hoping for. The moment was upon them. 8-1,000, 9-1,000, 10-1,000. Ready or not, here comes the king. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather in your word. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and our minds, that you would touch us each in a special way, that we would realize that your presence is here with us, and that these words would not just be something that we hear, but that they would live in us. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And so we wrap up our Advent series this morning, and it's, it's been an exciting journey in Advent, amen? amen. But it's also been a, a challenging journey that's called us not just to look expectantly to the child in the manger, not just to behold the wonder in the manger, and not simply to fall into the consumerism and the materialism of Christmas, but to look beyond the manger to this Christ child who became a man. And that man who became uh, the, the Christ who was crucified on the cross, buried and stuck in a tomb, but then on the third day was resurrected, and he will come again soon. And we've talked about the fact that in Jesus Christ, God has become it for us, and that he's come to seek and to save the lost. And we talked about the, the uh, trends in the world today, like the Mayan calendar and, and the, these folks that gather together on hills and think they know the day and the hour when <coughs> Jesus is going to return and they go up on a hill somewhere and sing Kumbaya and wait for Jesus. And guess what? Uh, December 21st has gone and passed and we're still here. Amen? Amen. But we should not dismiss the fact that Jesus Christ says that he's coming soon. Any day, any moment, any hour. And that this very day that Jesus Christ could return triumphant. And that we as, as followers of Jesus should not just celebrate, celebrate Advent for a couple weeks at the end of the year. We should not just celebrate Christmas uh, on Christmas morning one day a year. But we are Advent people. We should celebrate Advent every day of our life. We should celebrate the coming of the Messiah Jesus into our life every day. And we should live in this state of expectancy and readiness and prayerfulness. And we looked at the fact that we don't do that just by coming to church and sitting on our hands and being a bunch of pew potatoes, but we roll up our sleeves. We get down in the trenches of sin. We feed the hungry and the needy and the outcast, and we witness the love of God in people's lives. We're not supposed to, we got a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Amen? Amen. 
And we looked at the ministry of John the Baptist, who was the one who came proclaiming the messenger who had this work of refinement and purification, who was standing against society and standing against culture, proclaiming that the one is coming, that Jesus is Lord. And we have that same mission. We have that same calling in our life to proclaim to the world, to stand against culture, to stand against sin and the behaviors that have become acceptable in our world, and to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and that He's coming soon. Any day, any minute, any hour, the countdown is on. And we looked throughout the prophets, and each prophet spoke a word about this Messiah, this Lord that was going to come, this appearance of God. And each prophet was giving their prophecy in a time of darkness, and, and storm and exile and captivity in their life, but yet they give us this message of hope about a Messiah, a Lord, who would come. And the prophecy that we're going to look at this morning is no different. Micah, speaking prophetically uh, about Jesus in a tough time. Micah lived in a day about 700 to 800 years before Jesus when this uh, uh, world superpower of Assyria was threatening to, to come in and take Israel out, to send them into captivity, to send them into exile, and to scatter them to the four winds. And so uh, against the backdrop of fear and imminent danger and death, Micah gives us this prophecy about a ruler from Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, you, little tiny Bethlehem, this little small, obscure place, from this little small, the smallest of the twelve tribes of Judah, you, little, little obscure place, little obscure tribe, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, the greatest king that ever would be, and not just over Israel, but over all the world. From this obscure, humble little place, from a small little tribe, is going to come this great ruler whose origin is from old, from ancient of days. Thank you, Lord Jesus, who in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through Him. This one who is from old, from ancient of days, is coming. This great king is coming from this little obscure place in this little small way. And therefore, he shall give them up until the time. So the nation of Israel is going to go into this captivity. They're going to go into a state of exile for a period of time until when she who is in labor has brought forth. Now, throughout Micah's prophecy, he's following this metaphor of a woman in labor. A woman who's having to, to, to bear down and give birth to a child. And he's likening that to the experience of Israel, who right now is going through the birthing pains of something. But, but there's something coming on the way that's going to be a glorious moment. A child's going to be born. Now, as we as followers of Jesus can look back and understand Micah's prophecy as speaking about Mary. When she who is in labor has brought forth. When this person gives birth, when this woman gives birth to this child, it's going to be a special moment in the history of the universe. And then, this is, this is Micah speaking 700 to 800 years before Jesus. And then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. So when this woman gives birth to this child, Israel is going to come out of captivity. There, it's going to be a new day. Their hope is going to be fulfilled. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord. This one who's coming is going to come in the very power and the very strength of God. And he's going to be a shepherd. Jesus, the good shepherd, who lays down his life for his flock. And in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, in the very strength of the name of God himself, this one named Jesus is going to come. Emmanuel, God with us. And they shall live secure. For now he shall be great till the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. So when this Messiah comes, when this king, when this ruler comes, he's going to be great, there's going to be security, and there's going to be peace. And ladies and gentlemen, you can say what you want about Jesus Christ. You can believe that he was liar, lunatic, or Lord. You can call him Lord, you can call him Messiah, you can call him Savior, you can call him God in the flesh. But no matter what you make up your mind about Jesus, 
We all have to agree that no person, no being in the history of the universe has profoundly changed the world the way Jesus Christ did. Amen? Amen. Jesus has changed every corner of this earth, every nook and cranny, every shadow of every nation throughout all the world. He came to bring security and peace. You see, up until Jesus, we had some crazy conceptions about who and what God is, didn't we? Up until Jesus, we had some crazy conceptions about what love is. But Jesus came and revealed the very nature of God. He showed us who God is. He showed us who, what love is. There it is. It's on the wall. It's captured in one image. Love is not this movie screen, puppy dog, emotional thing. That's love right there on the wall. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That He put on flesh. That He made His dwelling among us. And He died for the sins of the world. And ladies and gentlemen, every nation and every place where the gospel has been proclaimed, that place has been transformed by it. And Jesus has brought a security and a peace over this earth that was never known until then. Some nations, like our own, were built upon the very foundation, the rock of Jesus Christ. And we did, we've enjoyed security and prosperity because of that. He's brought peace to all the world. Now, has the enemy been fighting against that? Has there been wars and rumors of wars and sickness and disease? And has the prince and power, the earth and the air, been fighting against that all the way? Yes. But Jesus came and he brought peace. He brought reconciliation of our hearts to God's heart. And he's brought peace on the earth. And he's coming again soon to bring that final peace to rest with God for all eternity. Enter this young lady named Mary. A young girl about 13 to 17 years old in a small little village in Nazareth. Betrothed to be married to this guy, Joseph. And Mary uh, goes to pay her, her cousin or her aunt, Elizabeth, a visit. Elizabeth, who is the uh, wife of Zachariah. Zachariah, who's a priest, goes into the temple. And an angel comes to Zechariah and says, you're going to have this kid. His name's going to be John. He's going to be great. He's going to be the prophet, the messenger that's been spoken of prophetically. And Zechariah kind of argued, well, my wife's too old to be pregnant. And so he struck dumb for a while. But Elizabeth, who's well beyond childbearing years, is pregnant. And so this just barely pregnant Mary comes to visit a very pregnant in her last trimester, Elizabeth. And in those days, Mary set out and went with haste to the Judean town in the hill country. Can you see Mary excitedly skipping along to go and see Elizabeth? Rushing to get to her. And where she entered the house of Zechariah, and she greeted Elizabeth. But when she greets Elizabeth, something special happens. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. Will you say that with me? The child leaped in her womb. So Mary comes into proximity of Elizabeth. And there's suddenly this, this turning of the child in the womb. Isn't that a great moment in, in the birth, in the pregnancy process, when mom says, come feel, the baby's moving. The baby's kicking. Come, come put your hand in and feel this movement. And Elizabeth was sensitive to that movement. And the baby that's in her womb, by the way, is John the Baptist, the messenger who's going to prepare the way. And suddenly, John leaps in her womb. And already, John is fulfilling his calling. He's not even born yet. But when he comes into proximity with King Jesus, he begins to proclaim, he begins to turn and leap in the womb that, that Jesus is here. And through that gentle movement in the womb that Elizabeth is sensitive to, she becomes filled with the Holy Spirit. John's already doing his job in the womb, folks. He's proclaiming Jesus is Lord, and Elizabeth is suddenly filled with the Spirit, which isn't that what the ministry of John came to do? To either fill people with the Spirit or fill them with fire for all eternity? That was his proclamation. And suddenly Elizabeth, sensitive to this moving, is, is baptized in the Spirit. Amen? And she exclaims with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She speaks prophetically about Mary, that, that there's something special about this child. You're a blessed woman, Mary. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? And ladies and gentlemen, here we get the first proclamation in the entire gospel of Jesus as Lord. It comes from the mouth of Elizabeth, still pregnant with John. Jesus, still in the womb, has already elicited that response. Jesus is Lord. 
Why is it that the mother of my Lord Jesus has come to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped <coughs> for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Mary, blessed are you because although the, this, this pregnancy has thrown you into some complicated circumstances, you could be stoned to death for this. You believe the Lord and what He said to you, and you're carrying this child. Most teenage girls, I know, if an angel came to them and said, hey, uh, you're going to have this baby. Like, no, sir, not me. I got, I got plans. I'm married. I don't want to get stoned to death. But Mary said, let it be unto me as my Lord has said. Faithful and reverent. And so what does Mary do? She sings a song. I love songs. Anybody love music? <laughs> Doesn't music stick sometimes? Uh, you ever have that phenomenon happen where somebody's singing a song or whistling a tune, then suddenly it's stuck in your head, right? Music sticks in our memory. Uh, I remember songs from back when I was a little child, back in the 80s. I can remember every word of the song. The meter and the rhyme and the rhythm of the song that, that, that is carried on in our mind and our hearts. And so Mary sings a song. And it's interesting because we know that most of the disciples couldn't read or write. Most of them were illiterate. Maybe some of them wrote down some things that Jesus said and did. But we know that this guy, Luke, who's writing this, was a traveling companion of Paul. And Paul was converted in about 35 to 38 AD. And Luke was his traveling companion, wrote down the gospel, wrote down the book of Acts for us. But Luke had an opportunity to go and visit with the eyewitnesses, with those first disciples with the people who saw Jesus crucified, resurrected, and, and raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And Luke had an opportunity to go along with Paul and visit those disciples, visit those first eyewitnesses. And guess who was alive back when Luke was paying his visits to folks? <coughs> Mary. Mary didn't die at the cross. Mary, uh, as far as we know, tradition tells us that she lived a long and a full life. And so it's quite possible that Luke had the opportunity to go to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and to give these words, just as Mary sang them at his birth, this song of praise that Mary sang. And it's one of the earliest confessions in the Christian church from the mouth of the mother of Jesus Christ. And Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul within me is elated and happy and joyful. My spirit rejoices. Mary knew that she needed a Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Do you see the, the reverence and the humility in Mary? That, that she knows that, that her lowly state, her obscure existence, her, her, her normal life in this small little whole long town of Nazareth. And she's humble and she says, surely... From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Surely from this point forward, every generation that will ever be is going to call me blessed. And guess what, folks? 2,000 years later, we're still calling Mary blessed, aren't we? Not because anything special about her or she deserves reverence or worship, but what? For the Mighty One has done great things for me. For God, even in my lowly position and my need of Him, has done great things for me. And holy is His name. Holy is his name. Will you say that with me? Holy, Holy is his name. Jesus. Messiah. Mashiach. Adonai. Lord. Jesus Christos. Jesus. Lord. Jesus. 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 There's just something about that name. Generation to generation. 
Those who realize their need for God and their brokenness and they, they fear the wrath of hell that they deserve and they reach out to Jesus, they can receive their Messiah by confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart that Jesus is Lord. He's shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the lofty and the arrogant and the intellectual with this simple little truth that God became a baby. In the virgin womb of this obscure teenage girl in a little place called Nazareth. He scattered the thoughts and the, 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 the mind of the wicked in their hearts. And he's brought down the powerful from their thrones. He's collapsed whole kingdoms and he's established an eternal kingdom. Not with the tip of a sword or a spear, but with love and with the cross. And with his own sacrifice of his own life and blood. He's brought down the powerful. He's lifted up the lowly. The obscure and the marginalized and the swept under the rug of society. And the hungry and the naked. He's lifted them up and he's brought down and he's sent the rich away empty. He sent those that don't have need for God. He sent those that are haughty and arrogant and too proud to accept the Messiah. And he's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Jesus Christ has fulfilled every prophetic word, every prophecy, the promises of Abraham all the way back thousands of years before he came. Jesus has fulfilled every messianic title. He's came and he's redeemed everybody across all the earth, not just for Israel. He's brought peace and salvation to all the earth. And the countdown is on. 1 1,000, 8 1,000, 9 1,000, 10 1,000, ready or not, here comes the king. And he's coming again soon. He's brought down the proud and the arrogant. He's lifted up the lowly and the humble. He's brought peace and he's brought love. And if we are sensitive to the gentle moving of the Holy Spirit in the womb of our soul, then we will see that God is still moving all around us. He's still moving in the small, obscure little ways. He's still moving in the little youth group that's suddenly growing. He's moving in your hearts when you're in Pastor Dale's Bible study. He's moving when you come to worship him as king. And that's what Christmas is about. Christmas isn't about a Christmas tree or putting presents under it. Christmas isn't about eggnog and putting out milk and cookies for Sandy. Christmas is about that Jesus Christ put on flesh, that God made his dwelling among us, that he came to suffer and to die for my sins and yours. He took our sins to the cross with him. Amen? Y'all should be shouting and praising God this morning. That God came in the flesh and redeemed us on the cross. And that's what Christmas is about. Don't lose that as we celebrate one day from now. Don't lose the fact that God become a baby. Don't lose the fact that Jesus put on flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that he loved you so much that he poured out his life and his blood so that you could be redeemed. And don't lose the fact that he's coming back any second, any minute, any hour of any day. Christ is coming. The countdown's on. 8-1,000. 9-1,000. 1000 Ready or not, here comes the King. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word and for your atoning work through the Son. And what a better way, there's no better way that we could possibly have than to celebrate at your table the memorial meal of your son Jesus who came, gave his body and his blood that we could be redeemed. And that is the gift of Christmas, Lord. It's not about wrapping paper or presents, but it's that you wrapped yourself in the flesh and came and made your dwelling among us to redeem us. And so we gather at your holy table and we remember the real meaning of Christmas. <clears throat> 